Hello chemistry folks, this is Kara Tierney from Monroe Community College and in this series of videos we're going to be talking about nomenclature, you've already seen one and here we're going to continue with talking about compounds, not just ions. We're going to be looking at ionic compounds, compounds made from ions and we're just going to be looking at the basic formulas and names. In future videos you will see some exceptions uh, to the rules that we're going to talk about here but for now we're just going to take it to the basics. An ionic compound is a compound that's made up of ions. Ions are charged atoms or groups of atoms and these groups of atoms are attracted to each other because they're oppositely charged. So you have an anion being attracted to a cation. An anion has a negative charge and a cation has a positive charge. And those charges cancel out to give you a neutral compound that is called an ionic compound. So let's look at an example of an ionic compound made from magnesium and iodine. So when magnesium and iodine are in their ionic form, they are uh, charged. Magnesium, as we've talked about before, will have a 2 plus charge and iodine will have a negative 1 charge. So when we look at this, we need to figure out what number of ions will give us a completely neutral compound. That is the goal of finding the formula of these ionic compounds. They want to be neutral. So if we have a magnesium with a 2 plus charge and an iodide with a negative 1 charge, we're going to need another iodide in there in order to balance out our charges. So our magnesium has a plus 2 charge. And our iodines, if we add them up, they're going to have a negative 2 charge. And so those will be neutral. And that gives us the formula of MgI2. We have one magnesium uh, cation for every two iodide anions. Now this is the way that you can find the formula of any ionic compound. There is another way that is basically doing the same thing but it has a bit of a shortcut to it called the crisscross method. And a lot of my students come to my class already learning this, so I think it's valuable to look at, but I don't want you to forget where this comes from, from the plus and minus charges actually balancing out to become neutral. When you do the crisscross method, the first thing you need to do is write the ions side by side with their charges. So if we're looking at a compound made from aluminum and oxygen, aluminum will have a 3 plus charge and the oxide will have a 2 minus charge. Now I'm calling it oxide um, because that's what an oxygen anion will be named. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I write them down. And the next thing you do is you cross the number of the ions charged over to be the subscript of the other ion. So what we do is I cross the 3 from the 3 plus of the aluminum over to be the subscript of O, and the 2 from O's charge becomes the subscript of aluminum. And this gives us a formula of Al2O3. When you do this, you need to erase the original charges. This is very important. I'm kind of picky about this, but I do not like to see charges appear in a ionic compound formula. Why? Because an ionic compound is neutral. Even though it's made up of charged particles, it, it itself is neutral. The next thing you need to do is you need to simplify any subscripts if needed. And this is a step that a lot of people forget. So let's say we have an imaginary uh, formula that comes out to be X2A4. Okay, this is completely made up. The 2 and the 4 are both divisible by 2, so I'm going to simplify that to only have 1X and then 2As. So I just divide both by 2. You might have to divide both by 3. When you are done with your formula, make sure, and this is very important, that you look at the positive and the negative charges and make sure that they balance out in equal zero. So when we look at uh, our aluminum and oxygen formula, I see that I have two aluminums. I'm just going to draw this kind of shorthand as two little atoms. And we know that they each have three plus. So they're not actually atoms, they're referred to as ions which gives us a total plus charge, uh, positive 6. We have three oxygens, so I'm just going to draw three little oxygens. They each have a negative 2 charge, so I'm just going to draw that here. 
And negative 2 times 3, that's a negative 6. So I see that the positive 6 and the negative 6 balance out to give us a total overall charge of 0. That is the key to doing this successfully. Now, if we need more than one polyatomic ion, we're going to write that in parentheses with a subscript on the outside. And I'd like to do an example that uses that right now. And this example would be if we are combining magnesium and hypochlorite, ClO minus, into a single compound. Now magnesium, we know, has a 2 plus charge. Hypochlorite, we are given that as a negative charge. If we do our crisscross, the 2 from the magnesium tells us we need two hypochlorites. The 1 from the negative 1 charge on hypochlorite is going to be a 1 for magnesium. And as you recall, we don't put subscripts of 1. So we need just 1 magnesium and 2 hypochlorites. That means I'm going to put my hypochlorite in parentheses with a 2 at the end. Hypochlorite must remain a ClO. It cannot change at all. Whenever you are doing a formula that involves a polyatomic ion, that polyatomic ion formula must remain the same no matter what. So in order to say that we need more than one of it, we need to put the entire thing in parentheses. So this is going to be our formula for magnesium hypochlorite. I want you to give these four examples a try on your own right now. I want to see how many you can do. Just give them a try, and then I'm going to go through with them in a little bit. So what I'd like you to do right now is pause the video, try them out, press play, and then we can go through them together. So let's look at these. Aluminum and chlorine. So as you recall, aluminum has a 3 plus charge, and chlorine has a negative 1 charge. This is going to give us, if we cross over, our 3 and our 1. This gives us 1 aluminum and 3 chlorines, AlCl3. Calcium and sulfur. Calcium will have a 2 plus charge. Sulfur will have a minus 2 charge, 2 minus. If we cross those over, we're going to get Ca2. S2. Now don't stop there because notice they have the same subscript. If they have the same scrub subscript, we need to simplify. It's much like when you, we deal with fractions. So we're going to divide both of those by two, which leaves us one of each. CAS. Magnesium carbonate. Magnesium has a two plus charge. Carbonate has a two minus charge. Does this sound familiar? We're going to end up, when we cross over with magnesium, two of them, carbonate, put that in a parentheses, we need multiples, two, and when we simplify, notice we have the two and the two, those need to simplify. That's going to go to MgCO3. Now, with these last two examples, if you know to simplify without doing that extra step in between, that is fine. Uh, just go straight to the simplified version. And in our last example, ammonium is an NH4 plus, sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. We're going to need two ammoniums, just one because that's plus one. Sulfate, that's going to give us, we need to put NH4 in parentheses since we need more than one, with a two and an SO4. So if you have any questions on this, jot down those questions. We can go over them in class first thing during the class period. But for now, let's move on and let's talk about how we name these compounds. Now, like I said in a previous video, nomenclature is just a very fancy word for saying, how do I name things? And in chemistry, we name compounds according to a system called the IUPAC rules. This is just uh, an acronym saying it's an international rule system. When we name compounds, we first need to differentiate between the different kinds of compounds. The two main kinds of compounds in chemistry are covalent compounds and ionic compounds. And I'm sure you've learned about them before, so we'll quickly review. Remember that covalent compounds are made up of nonmetals only, whereas ionic compounds are made up of ions that are oppositely charged. Now, often people will say, instead of ions, they'll say that ionic compounds are made up of a metal and a nonmetal. 
This is true if we are talking only about monatomic ions. There are polyatomic ions that can take the place of a metal or a nonmetal as well. So I just say that they're made of ions. So don't forget that a polyatomic ion can take the place. Let me just write that down. I can't talk and write at the same time. Polyatomic ions can take the place of the metal or the nonmetal. So be on the lookout of that. So when we are naming ionic compounds, we need to first learn how to name the ions because the names of the ions go directly into the name of the ionic compounds. For cations, cations are pretty simple. So say we're talking about sodium ions. Sodium forms a plus one charge, it's a cation, and the name is simply the name of the metal, sodium. I said name of metal because remember that all metals form cations and then we just put ion after it. So that's a sodium ion. Very simple. Anions have a little bit more to it. So if we look at a chlorine that has formed an ion, we use the first part of the name, chlor, and then instead of chlorine, we say chloride. We add ide to the end of the root of that uh, nonmetal name. So this is a chloride ion. Uh, let's look at a different one. So nitrogen forms N3 minus. This is going to be a nitride ion. So ide usually indicates that we have a monatomic ion. We are going to combine these into our names of our compounds. So when we name an ionic compound, the first word is just going to be the name of your metal or your cation. All right, so your cation is normally going to be a metal unless you've got one of our two positively charged polyatomic ions, which are ammonium or hydronium. If we have a variable charge metal, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. For now, we're only going to be using a single charged metal, so we won't worry about that exception for a while. The second word is going to come from the name of your anion. So it's either going to be the stem name of your nonmetal plus ide, or it's just going to be exactly what the polyatomic anion name is. And you combine those two words and that's your name of the compound. Uh, I think that showing you examples is the best way of explaining this. So here are five examples of ionic compounds and how we name them. Uh, the first one, notice it's just lithium and fluoride. Remember, we need to add the ide to that fluorine. Uh, if we look at the second example, MgBr2 is magnesium bromide. Notice there is no word in here to indicate that there are two bromide ions in the name. Now, in the name, we can get the formula by going back and doing our balancing of charges. Uh, you might have done the crisscross, right? We can figure out, because magnesium has a 2 plus charge, that we're going to need two bromides. And then the rest of the examples show how we include polyatomic ion names in our overall compound name. So let's practice this a little bit. So I would like you to give the formula for each of the following compounds. This is exactly what we did before, except for now I'm giving you the actual name of the compound rather than the elements that make up that compound. So I know you're going to look at A and B and maybe freak out a little bit, so let me just give you a hint. Ide, remember, means it's just chlorine. Eight is going to indicate that you're using a polyatomic ion, so you're going to want to look at your list of polyatomic ions. So pause the video now and try to write the formula for these four compounds, and then I will give you the answer once you press play. So here are your answers for problem example two. The problem that a lot of students will have, or the question that a lot of students will have right now, is asking why I have just a P here, phosphide. Remember that I'd indicates a single element. So uh, write down any questions that you might have about this. We can go over those. For now, we're going to go on to our next example. In problem example three, I've given you three compounds to name. I want you to give those a try, name them, and then uh, press pause. And when you press play, I'll give you the answers. Here are the answers to these three examples. If you didn't get them right, try and figure out what you did. If you still can't figure it out, we can address it in class. So write down any questions that you might have. And continue on with the next video in this series of nomenclature videos. I will see you there.